As the brightest amongst us toiled to save the world, the richest decided instead to abandon it. This is the hidden story of the Far Zenith Explorers. They left a dead planet and then tried to come back home. In Horizon Forbidden West, we first learn of the Far Zenith Explorers while looking for a backup copy of Gaia in the wreckage of the Old World. Whoa. Good morning. I'm Oswald Dalgard, and it is my pleasure to introduce you to Far Zenith. Forget what you think you know about us. Our truth is simple. We say reach for the stars, even if you have to cross 8.6 light years of space to get there. Please proceed into the auditorium, where we'll unveil our plans. Wonder what's in this auditorium. sapiens, us. We have always pushed the boundary as explorers, pioneers, trailblazers. And now Far Zenith is taking the next leap into the future. That's why we're proud to have resurrected the Odyssey. When our government's abandoned in orbit, Far Zenith will actualize in less than a decade. But that's only the beginning. When the ship is complete, we will send the Odyssey and her crew where no one's gone before. The Sirius system. There, we'll create humanity's first off-world colony. The Odyssey may take 300 years to reach it. But when we look up at the night sky, we'll know they're on their way. And in the words of our founder, the late Peter Chimbumbe, the true form of immortality is data corrupt. The playback stopped. The old ones could fly through the sky? Between the stars? Uh, well, yes, sort of. That ship, the Odyssey, it, it never made it to the other star. Something went wrong, and it blew up. Is that why Elizabeth gave them a backup of Gaia? For a colony? Public presentation file corrupted. Member recruitment file available. Do you wish to reactivate? Yeah, reactivate. Let's see what else they had to say. We all know the projections. Economic instability, new biocontagions, rampant AIs. How long before another catastrophe creates unacceptable risk for the world's elite? We here at Far Zenith believe, escape the inevitable. And so we reach for the stars. Now you've seen what we're building here. Infrastructure to support the Odyssey's construction. A state-of-the-art data center to facilitate rapid technological advancements. And you've seen how we're managing public perception. So invest and join us. Claim your birth on the Odyssey. Preserve your way of life beyond the concerns of Earth. Well, they were right about the world ending. They just didn't know how. As Aloy continues to explore, she finds something surprising. A message from her biological mother, so to speak, Elizabeth Sobeck, to a far zenith astronaut looking to leave this broken planet. The Zero Dawn terraforming system, the brainchild of Dr. Elizabeth Sobeck, empowered by nine subordinate functions, 
Gaia, the core of the system, is capable of advanced planetary engineering, an obvious advantage to our space colonization efforts. Operation Phase 1. Establish an asset within Project Zero Dawn. Status complete. Phase 2. The asset will secretly beamcast a complete copy of Gaia and her subordinate functions to this facility's data center. If all goes well, Zero Dawn staff will remain completely unaware of the transmission. Risks. Discovery of this operation could result in Zero Dawn withholding the already negotiated Apollo database. Special care must be taken not to alert Travis Tate, the expert hacker in charge of Hades protocol. In addition, extreme caution must be exercised in regards to Dr. Sobek herself. As one of the world's preeminent technologists, she may have instituted unforeseen security measures. A complete assessment is attached. This concludes the executive summary. I thought Elizabeth sent the backup here, but she didn't. Far Zenith stole Gaia. <sighs> it's here. Gaia version 6.9. Initializing. Hello. Hi. Elizabeth? Now, what's this we got here? A far Zenith conspiracy to steal a copy of Gaia? And her subordinate functions? Naughty, naughty. You want me to handle this, Liz? Blasphemers! Brood of vipers! With a mighty hand, I smite and pour troubles upon you! Stole you losers, but it's the mother of all logic bombs. So good luck repairing your data. And next time you start thinking you can outsmart a Tate, remember my salute. Off, Tilda. Zero Dawn got its ectogenic chambers. Far Zenith needs the Apollo database. There's no reason this incident. You tried to steal Gaia. I had nothing to do with it. And you punished those responsible. Your logic bomb has them scrambling to restore vital systems. I'm really supposed to believe that you knew nothing about this? Please, Liz. Humanity's chances are slim as is. You may not approve of our plan. But what if we're the only ones to survive? Don't you want us to have Apollo to remember our common past, our mistakes? I'm begging you. Fine. You'll get your copy of Apollo. Thank you. Let's speak again before- Goodbye, Tilda. I don't know. Time will not go. Elizabeth sounded sad at the end. I think this was personal. Indeed. Despite the dubious behavior of these wealthy plutocrats, Elizabeth had the kindness and perhaps even the foresight to share the knowledge of the human race via Apollo, even if the Far Zenith endeavor was folly, simply because if Zero Dawn failed, at least there was a chance for the amalgam of all human knowledge to live on. Little did she know that this simple act would save the planet once again. We don't hear about Far Zenith for a while in Horizon Forbidden West, as Aloy continues to plot her journey, finding the trail that Silen leaves, leading her to the desiccating husk of a once great foe, Hades, and to a quarry she's been searching for since the beginning of the game, a backup for Gaia to help re-terraform the planet. 
This is when her world and everyone's world changed forever. There's a current in the water. Not much, but maybe it's a way out. Genetic profile confirmed. Entry authorized. Greetings, Dr. Sobat. Please step inside. <laughs> Beta. Do we have it? Fantastic. Did the pulse originate here? Has someone... Something wrong? Shit! Spectres, Beta! Well, any idea what the hell a clone of Elizabeth Sobek is doing here? Maybe Gaia made one, when it destroyed itself a Hail Mary to repair the system. Mm hmm. Don't like the sound of that. Nah, don't like it. Don't want it. But the if it Nope. One's enough trouble. Eric! Yeah? Care to do a little downsizing? Hmm. Sure. What if she sent the pulse? Then that was foolish of her. But we got what we came for. So let's put it to use. I snap a lot of necks in VR. But that certain tremor, as life fades from the eyes. Ooh! No hollow quite gets it. Keep flapping your mouth. It makes a nice target. You actually think that primitive crap you got there can hurt me? This is gonna be fun. <laughs> I'm not hurting him. I need a way out of here. Maybe if I can bring the whole processor down. No there. Me. Now I can break the cup and hold the thing up. Go! That's not gonna help you. Reckon that thing ain't gonna help, girl. Come on. Come at me. Uh, gotta cut the main stem. If that thing comes down, it's only gonna kill you. Better than letting you have all the fun. What was that? 
Me killing what you wanted dead. What the hell did you think? The platform collapsed. Body went with it. Right. And since when don't you get what you want, huh? Spectres, search. Aloy is able to escape these modern humans with Gaia in hand and eventually finds a place to upload her. In doing so, the advanced AI is able to compute that these far zenith billionaires are likely the ones who sent the mysterious signal that awakened all of the terraforming AIs and nearly destroyed the planet. These far zenith humans seem to be upset that their interstellar signal didn't complete the job and have made the trip light years back to Earth to make sure that it's dead for good. The next time we hear about the far zeniths, we get to see one of them die. This proves that the far zenith humans, as indestructible as they seem, can be killed. Aloy also discovers that fellow clone of Elizabeth Sobek named Beta, who had escaped the far zenith's clutches and is now risking everything to help Aloy and her team save the planet. Beta explains a shocking detail about these interstellar travelers. So. Aloy, I suppose you want information about you and the Zeniths? Yeah. Why are they here? What do they want? How did they get you? But let's start at the beginning. I'm guessing they faked the destruction of their ship a thousand years ago? That seems consistent with their behavior. They wouldn't want to be followed. So far, Zenith established a colony world after all. Yes, for a few hundred years, but it didn't last. Some sort of natural disaster rendered it uninhabitable. Okay, so... The descendants of Far Zenith escaped a dying planet, and now they want to claim Earth for themselves? Not their descendants. What? Not their descendants. It, it, it's them. The same ones who left Earth a thousand years ago. You didn't know? How can they still be alive? They don't even look... What did they do to themselves? I believe it's a combination of pharmaceutical, cellular treatments, and technological implants. And, and you? Does that mean that you're... I'm not like them. I was made on the way to Earth, on the ship. I spent years studying in my training interface, all so that I could serve my function, access and control of the terraforming system. But why? What do the Zeniths want with it? When I discovered the Zero Dawn system had disseminated into its subcomponents, I thought my purpose was to fix it. But I don't think the Zeniths want that at all. I think they want to wipe Earth clean and start over. So the Zeniths want to exterminate life on Earth. That's what Gaia and I concluded too. But why? Why kill everyone just to take over? When they took me on missions with them, I saw how they... butchered the tribal people we encountered. They didn't seem to care about a rejuvenated Earth, so... I concluded that they must want a hard reboot of the system. Then they can redesign it to be exactly what they want. Mass extinction for their own comfort? Who thinks like that? Well, without their Gaia kernel, they'll have a hard time doing that. The Zeniths needed Elizabeth's gene print to access Zero Dawn facilities. So they made you. Trained you. And you went along with it? 
They told me I was born to interface with the Zero Dawn system. When we reached Earth, I pieced together what must have happened to Gaia and her subordinate functions. That's when I started to realize I wasn't meant to fix Gaia. That they must have made me so I could do what their remote extinction signal failed to do. Reboot Earth for their own benefit. So you know about the extinction signal? It was speculation, but the only logical conclusion why Gaia suddenly self-destructed after operating efficiently for centuries. Gaia would have only undertaken such a desperate course of action if it had detected a threat to life on Earth that was more dangerous than ceasing function altogether. I should have realized that she would also order the recreation of Elizabeth Sobek to rebuild her. Yeah, well, surprise. So we're dealing with the same far zenith people who once lived on Earth. What else do you know about them? They were some of the most affluent and powerful people on Earth. They controlled almost every major resource, every industry. Gerard commands them. He's the one who decided to set up a base. The others, Eric, Tilda, Verbena, they resent his authority over them, but in the end they always do what he says. Eric, he's the one I fought back in the Hades Proving Lab. He enjoys hurting people. Yeah, I know. You mentioned the Zenith set up a base here on Earth. Where is it? Off the coast, I think. Whenever I had to go on missions, I was transported inside of a Spectre drone. I couldn't see anything outside. But I did overhear the Zeniths talking about it once. They were discussing setting up a perimeter energy shield to repel the local fauna. I'm certain they have other security measures. Spectre patrols, machine wars, it, it must be impregnable. What's inside the base? Launch facilities, so they can shuttle back and forth to their ship in orbit. Plus, infrastructure to gather materials and fabricate anything they need. Are there more Zeniths than the ones you met? Uh, I'm not sure. I, I suppose there must be more of them in the base or back on the ship. For all I know, there could be more of them out in space, other survivors of the colony. You said the Zenith's colony in the Sirius system was destroyed. What happened? All I was ever told was that a natural disaster forced them to leave Sirius. I've speculated that it was an extrasolar object or a cataclysmic seismic event. Or maybe even an abnormally violent coronal mass ejection from Sirius A. The Zeniths never told you any details. They said the only thing that mattered was that they survived. First Earth, a thousand years ago, and then Sirius. Guess they survived old age too. We once again go a long time without hearing about the Far Zenith humans until we meet a tribe from the East called the Quen. It seems as though this society developed with focus technology at its core, and as a result they have a rudimentary understanding of the past and the humans that destroyed Earth. As we explore the West more, we discover a trap set up by one of the Far Zenith humans, trying to dissuade local tribes from discovering their base. We also learn from Alva a few more secrets about one Far Zenith, Eric, that tried to kill Aloy. Glowing lights. This must be the Zenith base. Looks like they have a shield around the entire place. Of course, they'd make their base on their own private island. But... Back to the current problem. I've got to check out the areas of Vera mentioned. Another more. Better deal with it. All right. How to shut this thing down. Another weird log from the Julius. This one mentions a third lore close by. I better check it out. It looks like I was right. The Zenus left these things here to draw in machines and protect the approach to their base.
Should be able to override the lore now. What's an outlander doing all the way out here? Clearing the valley? You must be one of the missing Tanakh. Everyone thought you were dead. Nearly. Dax and Kanala. Are they... Kanala's alive. Marshal Vera pulled her out. Speaking of... Aloy! Ivira, couldn't stay away, could you? And miss my chance to hunt the champion in the Valley of the Fallen? Never! And I see you found Eva- Now this looks like a fight. You with me, Marshal? My blade is yours! Should be the last one. And looks like there's a recording here. Hey, shithead. I got a task for you. The Julius is ready to serve. Shut up and do what you're told. Use the indigenous robots to keep this place clear of local vermin. I'll do it myself, but Gerard says I have to stay focused, so have some fun for the both of us, huh? Will do, Benefactor Visser. You can count on the Julius. So Eric left a simple AI in charge of the lures. Looks like it shut itself down when I overrode the last one. Well, I should let Avira know the valley's clear. You mentioned Eric Visser? How do you know about him? The Zenith who tried to kill you? He is known to the Quen as the Protector. Combing through data related to his work led us to breakthroughs related to weapons and military tactics. Knowledge our rulers use to conquer and expand. To become the Empire we are today. That's why he's one of our most revered ancestors. But, based on your encounter with him, it appears he's even more ruthless than we ever imagined. Yet another distorted interpretation in the legacy. Well, at least you're piecing together the truth. If only the overseers back home would do the same. Beta mentioned other Zeniths. Tilda, Verbena, and Gerard. I'm afraid I don't know anything about them. Whatever legacy they left behind, the Diviners haven't recovered. How the Quen have misunderstood this evil man is up for debate, but for now, Aloy and Beta are preparing to trap the final subroutine Hephaestus and hopefully begin the terrifying process in earnest to save the planet. Little did they know, the Far Zenith humans had considered this eventuality and instead are planning a trap. This leads to an encounter with Aloy and a very extended lesson on art history and how it shaped humanity. Buckle in because this is a long one. Well, hello, redundant copy. You've cost us quite a lot of time. Eric, get beta. And squash that bug while you're at it. Get behind me. Come on! Quit screwing around! Now we're having fun, right? No! <laughs> <laughs> Finally. Tilda, get Gaia and Hephaestus ready for transport. 
Matilda! I failed. Hush. All is not lost. Matilda! What the hell are you doing? Stop her! still be in a great deal of pain. I can assure you that we are safe. The others can't detect us here. You mean the other Zeniths? You must be Tilda. I wasn't sure if... Beta would have told you about me. Where is she? Alive. And while she isn't where she wants to be, not in urgent danger. We must discuss how to get her back, of course, after you've shaken off the cobwebs. When you're ready, take the stairs down the hall and, and come see me. In the meantime, I'll make breakfast. Breakfast? Okay. What is this? Just a few favorites from my collection. Rescued and stored here just before I went off world. Take a look, if you like. I'm curious to hear your impressions. My friend is dead. Beta and Gaia are gone, and you want me to look at old paintings? Don't be so quick to dismiss the comfort we can find in art. Or the insight we might gain. My favorite pairing on the left is Woman Reading a Letter by Vermeer, a true master. And on the right is a forgery, Woman Reading Music, which fooled experts into believing it was a priceless original. Early in my career, I became fascinated with such deceptions. Eventually, I developed scanning software that could detect fakes with unparalleled accuracy. Is that how you made enough money to buy your way onto the Odyssey? Oh no. I made my real fortune later. Why do you keep the forgery? I've always enjoyed studying the two side by side. Both painters capture light, color, and perspective. But what makes one a masterpiece and the other simply an imitation? The forgery looks... sharper? Good eye. The details are crisp. The contrast bold. It tells us more. And yet, we feel less. What's in the letter? Who can say? What does the painting tell you? She's... concerned? What it is written in the letter troubles her? Burden. She can't put down. Fascinating. Why go through so much effort to make a fake masterpiece? The forger initially painted under his own name, but found little success. His work was considered unremarkable. But when he took on the guise of Vermeer, suddenly it was celebrated as extraordinary. But it was a lie. And he knew it. Sometimes we struggle to glean what is real and imagined, even within ourselves. The irony of these two is that Vermeer died in obscurity. 
He had no idea his work would become some of the most precious, most copied, most preserved pieces in all history. Selene and Endymion. She's the goddess of the moon, whereas he's a simple shepherd. Beside her is the god of love, Cupid. So she's sneaking up on him? More like visiting him in secret. The torch that Cupid bears represents Selene's undying infatuation with him. Though the two must remain apart, her love will forever burn. And why can't Selene and Endymion be together? Selene took a vow of chastity, promising to never take a lover. So when she fell in love with Endymion, she could only visit him at night while he slept. But then wouldn't she be breaking that vow? Think of it as a forbidden love. Though circumstance keeps them apart, still they find a way to come together, however briefly. Aren't Selene and Endymion cold? Perhaps we should move on to another piece. Shall we move on? This is Rembrandt painting Jeremiah, a man in mourning. Mourning what? His home. The ancient city of Jerusalem. He foresaw its impending doom, but could do nothing to prevent it. So instead, he saved its treasures from destruction, just as I saved these works. You could say we're kindred spirits. About Jeremiah. If he knew his home would be destroyed, why didn't he save the people? Why save those relics? He tried, but no one would listen to his warning, so he saved what he could. But how did he know? He was a prophet. He saw an army invade and destroy the city in a vision. So it's more like he calculated which side would win a battle. What matters is that he was right in the end. If not for him, all those wonders would have been lost forever. At least this way, some part of his world survived. You know what I like the most about this piece? Even though he's the sole survivor, his home in ruins, left with only the remnants of his world, the light keeps the shadows at bay. There's still hope. Precisely. Take as long as you like. Portrait of the painter, Rembrandt's son, Titus, depicted in the habit of a monk. I don't get it. Why would someone like you, with infinite resources, care about this painting of... a boy in a hood? It's not the image itself, but the feeling it conveys. The face is bright and defined, but his eyes are downcast, heavy with misfortune and the background seems to swallow all light. The painting is infused with a sense of loss. I guess I understand how the painter feels. Works of art such as these can often cause us to look inwards at our own lives. I'm sorry about your friend. Had I been able to intervene, I would have. But the risk of losing you as well was too great. Everything went by in a blur. I couldn't get to him. You know, long before holograms and focus recordings, people relied on art 
to memorialize their loved ones. Because of works like this painting, their lives are immortalized. Rembrandt had four children by his wife. All but Titus died shortly after she gave birth to them. She passed not long after that. Titus became the only family Rembrandt had. Which is why he painted him this way. Indeed. Then tragedy struck again. Disease claimed Titus at 26. It's almost as if Rembrandt painted the future, closing in on him. Rembrandt actually painted several portraits of Titus, but this one has always been my favorite. It's honest. What do you mean? In others, Titus was portrayed in brighter, livelier states, but here, Rembrandt allows himself to express his true feelings. Sorrow, fear, hope, love, laid bare on canvas for all time. I see this one resonates deeply with you. Rembrandt's The Night Watch, by far the most famous painting my homeland ever produced. It was commissioned to honor a militia made up of influential citizens. I guess you must have been an influential citizen. In my day. But not as influential as you've been in this new world. The militia. They look disorganized. Where others painted such scenes in a stiff and stationary manner, Rembrandt chose to show them in action, preparing to march. He wanted them to feel alive. You can almost hear the commotion. Who's the girl in the painting? She's a strange one, isn't she? Bathed in light, though no one is paying attention to her. Many believe she's a symbol of the militia. A physical manifestation of their spirit, if you will. But she's not real? What's real in a painting? She's meant to represent the militia's virtue and victory. But I like to think they underestimate her. She looks as if she's seen something. What does she know? What secrets does she keep? There's so much detail to take in, isn't there? by Willem van de Velde, the most famous of his many maritime paintings. A ship crossing into the unknown. I guess you're familiar with that. Indeed, which is why I appreciate this composition in particular. Though waves and wind threaten to destroy the ship, it perseveres, clinging to the light even as darkness closes in all around it. Where is the ship going? To a faraway land, most likely. My ancestors used ships like these to explore the world, sometimes at great cost. What were they looking for? Anything of value. They were traders willing to face unknown dangers to make their fortunes. But no matter how far they went, they always turned their sails home. So this... Von de Velde only painted ships? It was his specialty. Following in the footsteps of his father, Willem the Elder. The two had quite a journey of their own, taking them all the way to the court of a foreign kingdom. Did they ever come home? No. But eventually their lives worked it. Take your time. Stunning, isn't it? Paintings weren't the only masterpieces of my people's golden age. This is Von Vianen's Lidded Ewer. 
molded from a single sheet of silver. What was it for? How like Elizabeth you are. <laughs> Function over form. Its practical purpose was less important than its meaning. Von Vianen created it in honor of his late brother, who himself was a famous silversmith. A memorial? Yes. Such beauty from sorrow. If this ewer was a memorial, how did you end up with it? As the pharaoh's swarm closed in, my homeland's greatest museum gave it to me, along with many other works, in the hope that I could preserve them. A masterpiece like this was too important to lose to history. I even considered bringing it with me off-world to ensure its safety. Why didn't you? I took a calculated risk. This vault seemed more secure than the unknowns of space. Besides, I thought someday I might return. A long life, after all, has its advantages. Now, lo and behold, here I am. Exquisite, isn't it? A lot of weight on his shoulders. I know the feeling. I should move on. Pulling out her own hair. Out of madness, out of grief. It's hard to watch her suffer. I should move on. There you are. Feeling better? How did you find us at the cauldron? And what did you do to everyone right before I passed out? All business, I see. Well, suffice it to say we were keeping a very close eye on Hephaestus, knowing we would need it at some point. Your ruse didn't fool us, and as for my little trick, it was an overload of the senses accompanied by an energy discharge. Gerard and Eric were only momentarily disoriented due to their shields, but it, it rendered you unconscious while I got you out. Perhaps some breakfast might steady you a bit? This was your house. The one you recreated for Beta, in the data channel you shared. How perceptive of you. Please, this way. After everything your people have done? You think I'm just gonna sit down and have a chat with you? They're not my people. They never were, and especially not now. You shot off into space with them and live with them for a thousand years before coming back. So what made you suddenly turn on them? Quite simply, this. My old focus. You repaired it? But that means you've seen incredible things. What you've accomplished in two decades of life thousand years at my back and I haven't even come close. I'm sorry if I invaded your privacy. 
but I had to in order to understand, to be enlightened. You truly are Elizabeth's blood with her drive, her sense of mission, her integrity. Watching all this shamed me for the company that I've kept. Having seen it, all I want is to help you. Even if it means stopping your friends? Especially so. Please, sit down. There. That's better. Now, we must recover Beta and Gaia at all costs. By now, you must know that Gerard intends to use Gaia to reboot the Earth's biosphere. Remaking this world to specifications that would only suit us immortals. This process will kill every living thing on the planet. He calls it a clean install. Not if I stop him first. Not if we do. And once he and the others are gone, we can work together to fulfill Elizabeth's dream. I'm sure Beta told you that there's a build of the Apollo database on board our ship, a complete collection of human knowledge. With that and Gaia, we could do everything Elizabeth wanted. Heal the biosphere, educate the people of this world, uplift them, create the world she imagined. Let's not get ahead of ourselves. From what I've seen, your friends are invincible. I do wish you would stop calling them my friends. And they're not invincible. In fact, a friend of yours has found a way to defeat them. Silence. Oh, he's been a busy bee, building an army powerful enough to crash through Gerard's precious base. Yeah, Regala and her rebels. Even now, she's preparing a final march on the Tanakh the capital. When she wins, she'll have the entire tribe under her control. Hundreds of warriors and machines to throw at the base. She's been duped. They'll all perish, of course. But it should be enough to break Gerard's defenses and allow silence to kill him. Along with all the others. Using the new weapon he's developed. Yes, he's found a way to circumvent our shields. Truly an exceptional man, he's planned for everything, except you and me. You see, while his army is battering down Gerard's doors, you and I will sneak in through a back way, one that only I know about, while Silence and my friends are busy battling each other. We'll take back Beta and Gaia. I told you I want to help you. I mean it. You said Beta is not in urgent danger. So what are the Zeniths doing to her? Putting her to work. Merging Hephaestus with Gaia. A difficult, time-consuming task, as I'm sure you know. They will compel her if need be. But her life is not in danger. She's the only one who can do it. Because you people made her to be nothing but a tool. Gerard's idea, not mine. They always viewed me with suspicion when I attempted any form of kindness towards her. That's why I created the Data Channel, a virtual place where we could speak in peace. So this channel you shared with Beta, none of the other Zeniths ever found out about it. Gerard believes he's the most cunning of all of us. Even after a thousand years, he still can't imagine that I would outwit him. The channel allowed me to interact with Beta away from their mistrustful eyes. It offered us a chance to be ourselves. Until you cut off all contact. Yes, though it pained me. I was worried that our meetings would do her more harm than good. Well, she felt like you tossed her aside. I was afraid the others would find out and punish her. 
She may not have had the comforts of friendship anymore, but at least I ensured she was safe. I know it seems harsh, but you must believe that her well-being has always been paramount to me. Why did you make the data channel look like this place? I built this house as a shelter to weather any storm. A safe place. Not just for me, but for the art stored below. Cultural artifacts of incalculable value. Truly some of the greatest achievements of human civilization. And you wanted Beta to see them? Yes. Her upbringing was so cold and technical. I thought if she could experience Vermeer and Rembrandt, it would bring something else into her life. A heritage every bit as valuable as the scientific and technical data being drummed into her. I'm sorry I had to cut off contact, but I'll never regret sharing this house with her. She needed its shelter even more than I did. My old focus. How did you find it, let alone repair it? When we encountered you at the Hades Proving Lab, Gerard saw you as a redundancy. I knew better. You were a revelation. After your dramatic escape, bravo, by the way. Gerard and Eric assumed you were dead and gave up the hunt. I wasn't so sure. When the others were busy, I returned to the lab and searched for any trace of you. That's when I found this little treasure. Not easy to repair, but certainly worth the effort. As I watched your life unfold, you were like a splash of color on a worn canvas. What Liz was, and more. Did you show it to the others? Of course not. It was your actions that inspired me to defy them. It's worth noting that if I hadn't found it and watched its contents, I wouldn't have known to save you at the cauldron. You'd be dead. So I should be grateful? If you like. So you know all about me. What about you? What would you like to know? Well, start with your life on Earth. When I was eight, Terrorists flooded my home city. Thousands drowned, my parents included. I was one of the few who survived. My guardian sent me to boarding school. Among my peers, I was the strange girl, the orphan to be avoided. All because of circumstances beyond my control. Oh. So we're a lot alike, huh? Aren't we? You were an outcast, but you didn't let that stop you from getting what you needed. Neither did I. I climbed my way out of desolation and used my wits to build a fortune. First from the technical analysis of art and the detection of forgeries. Profitable expertise in those days. But as it turned out, the software I developed was even more useful for counterintelligence. From there, it was only a short step to gathering extremely valuable intelligence on my own. You were a spy? More like a service one could turn to for information. I had to remain anonymous, of course, to protect my privacy. But despite that anonymity, Far Zenith inevitably sought me out. What happened when Far Zenith approached you? They painted an irresistible vision of humanity's future. One where we need not fear illness or death, where we explored the furthest reaches of the stars and thrived. It was only later that I realized that they only intended to bequeath this future to the rich and powerful. By the time I finally figured it out, the walls were closing in, Faro's machines were devouring the Earth. So I accepted Far Zenith's invitation to a berth on the Odyssey. I wanted Liz to come, but she had nobler plans, as you well know.
So you didn't know the other Zeniths were monsters until it was too late? I, I knew some of them were, certainly. It, it wasn't until we were off-planet that I understood the true scope of their greed. I was grateful to simply be alive, but the others became obsessed with a kind of effortless immortality. They built a colony where machines serviced their every need, where any memory or fantasy could be endlessly savored in virtual reality. It wasn't life. It was stultifying, a pampered dream state. As the decades passed, I withdrew more and more, alone yet again, but this time with eons to consider my mistakes. Now, finally, having met you, I feel like I have a second chance. To do what? Help you, of course. To fulfill Liz's dream, which isn't so different from Farzina's original vision. A better future for humanity. Beta told me your colony was destroyed. That you came back to Earth because you had nowhere else to go. It's true. After we reached our destination, a planet in the Sirius star system, we spent decades building a new home. The physical constraints of Earth, the boundaries of mortality, gone. To think of what we could have done with it. It might have been a utopia. Instead, we stagnated, absorbed in effortless comforts and virtual realities. It took a cataclysm to finally yank us out of our stupor. What happened? A massive geological event. We knew of instabilities in the planet core, but we underestimated them. By the time the collapse was upon us, it was too late to stop it. Only a few of us made it to the ship in time. We set course for Earth, the only safe harbor left to us. Which you decided to make unsafe for anyone else. Not me. Gerard. He believes it's better to wipe the canvas clean than work around the smudges. No more primitive tribes, no more combat machines, only a blank slate to do with as he pleases. But we will stop him. All we have to do is get into that base. What exactly is your plan to sneak into the Zenith base? We will make use of a lesson I learned from an early age. Always know your exits. In this case, a place where Gerard's new construction meets the ancient foundation, a passage that only I can access. When Silence flings his army at the base, we will enter through this back door, bypassing most of the fighting. The distraction will provide us with a window in which to rescue Beta and Gaia. Once we're inside the base, where will we find Beta and Gaia? Here in the command center. By then, Gaia will have been reunited with all of its subordinate functions, including Hephaestus. What about the Alpha build of Apollo on your ship? A simple matter of recovery once the others have been dealt with. With that in hand, we'll have everything we need to make this world as it should be. How do you know about Silence's plan? He isn't the only one adept at spyware. You hacked his focus? No, he's too careful for that. But his subordinates? <laughs> Not so much. He gave additional focuses to the tribals he branded the Sons of Prometheus. The ones working with Regala. By tapping their focuses, I learned about most of his dealings. The distribution of override technology, the arming of Tanakh rebels, and the secret pact with Regala to attack Gerard's base. But how did he come up with a weapon that can take down your shields? That's the one thing I haven't been able to figure out, but however he did it, I'm quite certain it will work. With it and the Tanakh army, victory seems to be within his grasp. Such a shame he'll be disappointed. Regala's only interested in killing Hakaro and waging war on the Karja. 
What does she have to gain by attacking Zenith? It's the price she must pay for her war. Without the ability to override machines, her little rebellion would have languished in the desert. So she trades with the sons of Prometheus. Machines to help her overthrow Hikaru. In exchange for an assault on the base. Pride has deluded her into thinking she can actually survive such a battle. And all without ever knowing who the sons of Prometheus really answer to. Yet for all of Silence's brilliance, still he underestimates you. That blind spot is what will allow us to take Beta and Gaia right out from under him. While hundreds of Tanakh are cut down outside. So you knew Elizabeth. What was she like? Liz was everything she was. I see in you and more. Your ingenuity, your determination, your moral compass. You've managed to distill her greatest qualities and make them your own. I'm not asking about me. Tell me about Elizabeth. What was she really like? The honest answer is that I don't actually know. For all the time that I spent with her, she always kept a part of herself locked away. It was like that from the moment we met. So when you met Elizabeth, she was what? Distant? Aloof? Not aloof. Not exactly. It was a summit in Paris about machine learning, a touchy subject in those days because regulatory authorities were just starting to clamp down on AIs. Liz gave the keynote address. She had already achieved great renown for her work in automated environmental reclamation. But in her address, she was just starting to imagine the next step, an AI-driven system that wouldn't just act on its programming, but actually take responsibility for its sphere of influence to care about life, not just follow orders. Revolutionary stuff. I was fascinated, and I wanted to meet her for a long time. I watched her after her talk. She had spoken with such moral authority, such empathy. But after that, she retreated. I could tell she felt uncomfortable with all of her admirers. It was as if giving the talk had cost her something. I didn't want to be a pest, so I planned my approach carefully. So how did you finally approach Elizabeth after her talk? I picked the right moment. The morning of the next day, right as she came back to the conference, she had just had her coffee. She was fresh, rested. It was like she had braced herself for the onslaught of colleagues. I asked if I could walk with her, then put forth a question about her talk that I thought was intelligent. Her answer made me realize it wasn't, but she was very welcoming, almost as if we were previously acquainted. It was only halfway through the conversation that I realized she knew exactly who I was. It was quite a shock to me. My business was trafficking in secrets, and I took great pains to protect my anonymity. So that was Liz, perpetually one step ahead. I came to view our meeting as a metaphor for our friendship. She always seemed to know me far better than I knew her. I guess I know the feeling. First Varl, now Hikaru and the Tanakh. Your plan would wipe out an entire tribe. There has to be another way. We are in an admittedly desperate situation, but I assure you there isn't. Remember Zero Dawn. Elizabeth's sacrifice, sometimes many have to die for a new world to grow. If 
sure looks impossible. Look deeper. Wait. The data channel. It still exists, doesn't it? I need you to open it. Let me talk to Beta. Impossible. We might be detected. It's worth the risk. There is another way, one where the Tanakhs survive. But we won't. If the others... If you want to help, open it. What are they doing to her? Virtual reality dissociation. The manual merge of Hephaestus will take hours upon hours of tedious micromanagement. If she resists the work, they run simulations to induce feelings of isolation and despair. Beta, can you hear me? You're alive. They're watching me. I, I, I can't hold up this extra projection for long. You should have killed me. No. No, look at me. I'm coming for you. I promise. Okay? I just need you to hold out a little while longer and work on the merch. again when it's time. Can you hold on? As long as I know you're coming for me, I can endure anything. All right. I did as you asked. Now I think you need to tell me what you're planning. I'm going to take Silent's army away. I don't need it. Only the weapon he made to penetrate your shields. And how do you propose to get it? Ask him nicely? With Aragala and her rebels, he won't have a choice. We'll be his only option. Only option for what? What did you tell her? That is between me and my sister. Will be Silent's only option for crashing that base. I'll tell you the rest later. But first, there are a couple of things I have to do. Oh. And what are those? Lay my friend to rest. And then I'm going to use the override that Beta gave me at Gemini to put an end to Regala's rebellion. From the air. Wait. Since you insist on doing things your way, I know of something that will truly help you make a grand entrance with the Tanakh. The ancient Horus Titans still possess electromagnetic energy cells as part of their arsenal. Drop one of those on Regala's army and they'll receive quite a surprise. So go, do what you must. I'll come to your base if you manage to bring silence to the table. Not if, when. With Beta gone and Tilda, a far zenith human herself, now part of the team to save the planet, it's time to assault the base with Silent's secret weapon, a device that can render the shields of the far zeniths completely disabled. This gives Aloy a chance to have some final words with Tilda before the assaults. The truth is, I can't actually get us into the base, but she can. 
The company you keep is even worse than I thought. Not a fan of surprises, are you? Oh, well, look. That must be your little invention. Does the weapon work? Without self-destructing? Of course it does. I've eliminated the imperfections and greatly improved its design and output. How can we be sure? Care for a demonstration. Enough, both of you. We're in this together, at least for now. Go talk to Erend. Tell him I said to give you rooms of your own. I'll come see you when I get a chance. Oh no, you first. Look at everyone in the control room, so Tilda can tell us what she knows about the Zenith base. Welcome back, Aloy. Despite my reservations, you managed to secure silence and his weapon. You're truly a shining example of Liz's fortitude. I've been thinking about what you said at your house. How you were friends with Elizabeth. It was more than that, wasn't it? Perceptive as ever. You're right, we were together for a time. Okay, so... What happened? I was an orphan. I had always been alone. By my 30s, I was starting to wonder if that was simply my fate in life. And then I met Liz. We kept running into each other at conferences. We'd have coffee. At some point, it became drinks. I thought it was just shop talk, an exchange of ideas, but then I was surprised at how much I looked forward to seeing her. Soon we were flying halfway across the world every other week just to meet up. For the first time, I didn't feel lonely. I could imagine a future where I wasn't. I think Liz felt the same way at first. She had lost her mother a few years back. I filled a void for her. I know I did. But as time passed, it seemed as though she wanted less when I wanted more, and so we ended things. So helping me, restoring Elizabeth's dream, it's what, a... a second chance, yes. I made a mistake leaving Earth while Liz stayed behind. I should have done more. So when I saw you, a woman who has carved her own remarkable path, beyond even what made Liz a phenomenon, I knew I had to help you, to do right by her. Why do you think Elizabeth pulled away? I've wondered that for a thousand years. She was brilliant, a visionary. She cared so deeply for the world, for the betterment of humanity. But it also felt like she kept everyone at arm's length, including me. She never wanted to share her burdens. I think, in the end, she had a core that she never let anyone be part of. Sometimes I wonder if anyone really knew her. I found a recording of you and Elizabeth back in the Proving Lab, after Farzineth's attempt to steal Gaia. Yes. A most unpleasant conversation. She said something after the call. I think she regretted how things ended between you. Did she? All this time, thank you for telling me. I've always hated that 
those were the last words we ever said to each other. And that her last impression of me was as a functionary of Far Zenith, not who I truly am. Why did you make the data channel look like your house? I built that house as a shelter to weather any storm. A safe place, not just for me, but for the art stored in its depths. Cultural artifacts of incalculable value. Truly, some of the greatest achievements of human civilization. And you wanted Beta to see them? Yes. Her upbringing was so cold and technical. I thought if she could experience Vermeer and Rembrandt, it would bring something else into her life. A heritage every bit as valuable as the scientific and technical data being drummed into her. I'm sorry I had to cut off contact, but I'll never regret sharing this house with her. She needed its shelter even more than I did. When it's time to break into the Zenith base, what can we expect? I'll go over the full layout once you've assembled your friends. Suffice it to say, we will need to push as fast as possible to Beta in Gaia's location, dealing with heavy resistance along the way. There are also printing facilities where the others have been amassing the natural resources they've stripped from the region. What for? First for use in the base's infrastructure and then to fabricate more Spectre drones, a small army of them. When I was out in the wilds, I saw a shuttle take off from the island, heading for space. It was likely ferrying materials to and from our ship in orbit. After hundreds of years luxuriating in our digital comforts, the ship was barely space-worthy when we made our escape. Disaster can strike at any moment we've learned our lesson. Have you figured out how Silence's weapon works? No, and he's been very careful not to allow me near it. I'll admit it bothers me, but regardless of how it functions, I am confident it will deactivate the other shields en masse. How many of them are in the base? Ten, including Eric and Gerard. Only a handful of us made it to our ship when our colony collapsed. You said before that you're not like the other Zeniths, that you never were. But you went along with all of their plans. Out of necessity. I'm not proud of it. But complicity became a means of survival, both when Earth was consumed and when the colony on Sirius was destroyed. I did what I had to. But I resolved to remain one step ahead of the others to try to undo what damage I could. Hence the data channel with Beta the secret passage into their base and the little trick I pulled to save you. When I was in the ruins of Vegas, I found data on a man named Stanley Chen. I think he was a Zenith. Stanley, ever the optimist. He was one of the good ones. When we established our colony, he built an exact replica of Las Vegas in virtual reality. Lights, shows, gambling, every detail perfectly recreated. And while others cloistered themselves in their own fantasies, he flung his doors wide to everyone. The way you're talking about him, I'm guessing he didn't make it back to Earth? No, he perished when our colony was destroyed. He would have been thrilled to discover that part of his beloved city survived. When Beta escaped and hid in an ancient research facility, I saw another one of the Zeniths, for Bena. Who was she? A dull star amidst a sea of brighter constellations. Unlike most of Far Zenith's members who amass their wealth through shrewd business deals and technological achievements, Verbena inherited her billions. Her father had achieved great success in the luxury holotourism industry. At age 24, she became the world's most eligible bachelorette, branding herself a life designer, someone who leverages their fame to influence the choice of others. 
What? Like a cult? In a way, yes. Well, she must have done something right to have survived this long. She was her own brand of Ruthless. That much is true. But even rats can cling to a vessel for escape. So, Eric... Was he always a bloodthirsty psychopath? I believe he got worse over time. On Earth, he was the founder of a profitable private military company. A band of cutthroats, in other words. Even as governments abandoned human combatants in favor of automated warfare. He found success with clientele that required a more personal touch. There were also rumors that he personally hunted and killed his targets. On occasion, all for the thrill of it. But on Sirius, he retreated to virtual reality simulations. In them, he could go on rampages as violent as he pleased, though I suspect with diminishing satisfaction. All of us tribe believes he was one of the greatest people from the old world. Then they would be quite disappointed to meet him, though I'm sure he'd bask in the adoration. What can you tell me about Gerard? He was the head of the world's largest financial conglomerate, and as such had dealings with almost every major corporation. It made him one of the wealthiest people on Earth, and certainly the wealthiest among Far Zenith. What does one person do with that much money? Buy more, more power, more influence. Gerard's always believed himself to be a refined patrician, able to maintain control with a polished smile but beneath that exterior is a cold and calculating operator. It was his decision to restrict Beta's upbringing to her digital educators, the avatars of the Apollo database, while we were painted as her benefactors. Well, we'll deal with him soon enough, and the others. I would very much like to see his face when he realizes we've beaten him. Okay, so I've had run-ins with a handful of Zeniths. What about the rest? An array of the wealthiest people on Earth. Titans of their industries. And let me guess, all selfish and ruthless to the core? Most, but not all. There were a few with whom I got along. Annika Merjani, for instance, was always delightful. She founded the Holonet's most successful dance channel and was herself mesmerizing to watch. And I had fascinating discussions with Song Jiao about her work in cellular biology. Our immortality treatments are due in part to her achievements. But then there were others like Devin Miller, the CEO of a fast food printing corporation. His only real preoccupations were perfecting his golf swing and taking self hollows. When I think about all of us, we really should have accomplished more. We had eternity. Okay. I'll let you know when it's time. I'll be here until then. And thank you, Aloy, for giving me this chance. My past has always been a struggle. More than once, I've lost everything. But when I look to the future, I see Liz's dream fulfilled. A universe of new possibilities. Maybe we can make it happen. We will. I won't let anything get in the way. I promise you that. Okay, everyone. We all know what's at stake. Beta, Gaia. Not to mention life on Earth. Now, it might seem like the Zeniths are invincible, but they're not. We've got what it takes to break into their base and defeat them. We even have one of them on our side. Tilda, show us the base. It is constructed atop the ruins of an ancient military facility on an island to the southwest. I can get us inside. To this location. Undetected. How exactly? 
You'll know when you need to. Once inside, our goal will be this structure, the launch tower. Gaia and Beta are being held at the top. But along the way, we will face overwhelming resistance. Most importantly, from Gerard, Eric, and the others. But also... Once I take away their shields, we should be able to deal with them. But it will be easier to deploy the device if someone else is carrying it. I'll need a strong back. Carry stuff? Yeah, I can do that. Even if your device works, there will still be Spectre drones scores of them. If only we had an army to fight them. I've got that under control. You'll know when you need to. All right. We'll meet up again just before we go in. Where's the best place to rendezvous? On the coast, just across from the island. Once there, I'll show you the way. Okay. I'll let you know when I arrive at the rendezvous point. And then you can join me. In the meantime, do whatever you need to prepare. Understood? Aloy. Where are the others? Not far behind. Egghead here couldn't stand traveling with the pack. Are we all here? Then let's begin. A tunnel. An ancient escape route from the ruins on the island. When I realized it ran all the way across the water, I, I thought it might prove useful to come and go undetected. So I concealed it from the others. Shall we? I wish there was a less pungent way to get way inside the base. Agreed. There's the launch tower. That plane offers a little cover, so the only viable path is through there. There will be specters guarding it, and many more can be deployed from those hangars. All right. Alva, Catalo, get to it. Where are they going? Somewhere important. Erend, you're with me. You guys, take the high ground in case we need covering fire. Tactically sound, I suppose. What will she do? There's a sensor node nearby. If I hack into it, I should be able to scramble the network and keep you undetected. But not for long. Then we should proceed. One more thing. Open up the channel to beta. Audio only. Aloy, we're here. And we're coming for you. You know what to do, right? As long as you hold up your end. We will. See you soon. Be careful. Let's go. Get to the launch tower as quickly as possible. I'll do my best to conceal our intrusion. <laughs>
Ah, now we know who's been causing all the fuss. Tilda's little pet. Silence! Zenith, inbound! Can we drop their shields, please? I'm powering it up. Stay still. This is pointless! You can't hurt us. Face it. Your worms that ooze to the cracks into our basement. Silence! One moment more. But I might just spare you if you give up Tilda. I think it's safe to say she's forfeited her share of our operation. Permanently. Ah, there. No? Nothing. Fine. All right, people. Light them up! Are we supposed to be scared? Take long before he preps the shuttle for launch. Then he'll be able to take Beta and Gaia into orbit and onto the Odyssey beyond our reach. We gotta go through there? I fail to see another option. Then we'll carve a path. Ready? Stop, Gerard. Get to the top of the tower and free Beta. Aloy, we're... <laughs> Time machine filth! Apologies for that. We're okay. As long as all the hurries. I'm almost into the network. Just do the best you can. Okay, an elevator. Promising. We got some unfinished business, little girl. Trust me, you're gonna wish you had one. You want this as much as I do. I'm taking 
taking you down! Rescue your sister. I'll regroup with the others and make sure they're all right. Inspectors have almost wiped each other out. What was that? Aloy, Gerard just activated the self-destruct failsafe on the printing matrix. He's taking control of a number of systems. Including the lift? I'm afraid so. He's restricted its access to the top. You'll have to climb from there. I have to go. I almost have. Aaron? Is everyone all right down there? Uh, mostly. We're cleaning up the last few Spectres. What about the Zeniths? Dead, I think. Izo told me you got Eric. Good work. Yeah. Thanks. I guess only Tilda and Gerard are left then. Aloy, you there? Listen, I got into the network, but only for a minute before I was shut out. I found a bunch of flight plans and trajectories, as if the Zeniths were planning to leave Earth. Doesn't make any sense. I know, but there's more. The files I found have a lot of references to something called Nemesis. Whatever it is, the Zeniths are afraid of it. Alva? Alva! What's going on here? Maybe Beta can help me figure it out. If she's okay. With the plan now a success, there is a final wrinkle. Tilda not actually being what she appears. Are you okay? Look, I know you've been through a lot, but you have to help me access the Zenith network. I need to see their files, anything referring to the word Nemesis. Okay. O over there. The systems are down all over the base. I should be able to take advantage of... 
Yes, Nemesis. Here. There's something in deep space. It's following the Zeniths to Earth. Look. Escape vectors. Alva tried to warn me about this. The Zeniths aren't planning to stay here. It's a machine of some kind. O or a swarm of them. The energy readings are... astronomical. Aloy, I don't think a natural disaster destroyed the Zeniths colony on Sirius. This thing did. Earth isn't a new home for them. It's a way station. They're on the run. I see you've been busy. And you've been lying. Nemesis, what is it? It is us. The minds of Far Zenith. Or failed copies of them, anyway. Back on Sirius, some of my peers weren't satisfied with physical immortality. They wanted digital transcendence. A way to upload their minds into any form, organic or mechanical. Nemesis was a failed experiment to that effect. Abandoned, but never erased. An immense database of our memories, emotions, and prejudices left to fester. And it destroyed your colony? We didn't realize it had gained sentience until it broke containment. It had everything it needed from our memories. Security protocols, system specs, override codes. It hacked everything before we knew what hit us. Then it took over our printing facilities, allowing it to gain any machine form it needed to wipe us out. But why? Imagine being trapped alone for decades with only the twisted echoes of megalomaniacs for company. It hates us for abandoning it to that prison. And now that it's free, it will do anything to destroy us, including denying us a safe harbor on Earth. The extinction signal that woke Hades. You didn't send it. Nemesis did. Finally, you understand. And when that failed, it launched from Sirius to finish the job itself. Which is why we must flee to a random planet circling a random star somewhere it can never find us. With Gaia, so you can build yourself a new world. That's the plan. Even now. Earth is finished, Aloy. Nemesis will scour it of life to deny its creators a viable home. But Elizabeth's dream won't die. You'll come with me to the stars. And with Gaia, we'll create a new world. Together. Where that monstrosity could never find us. What? No. I loved Elizabeth. More than you could ever know. And I let her stay behind to die with the rest of humanity. A mistake I have regretted for a thousand years. Now she stands before me again. Not some inferior copy. But her best possible self. So I'm not asking. You're coming with me. It may seem harsh now, but you'll forgive me in a few centuries. You can't force me, Tilda. Your shield is gone. I have something better. Spectre Prime, to me. Take cover! Get to the door! Submit Aloy. You can't win. No! I've heard that before. I knew you didn't 
truly want to hurt me? Before I can do some damage. Plating. So ends the story of the Far Zenith humans. They look to abandon a dying world and instead, thanks to their own hubris, they killed their hope for the future. The one shining light though, a choice that Elizabeth Sobeck made to give them the Apollo data, all of the knowledge of humanity, which was once saved and is now finally in the hands of Aloy and her compatriots. She thought she could lock me away on her ship. Like one of the paintings in her mansion. A thousand years of regret. And she still didn't get it. 